dictionary defines the noun form of the word radical as a person who holds or follows strong convictions or extreme principles. They're also referred to maybe as an extremist. Now, sometimes radical people accomplish something that revolutionizes their field entirely. Take Paul Lauterbur and Peter Mansfield's invention, magnetic resonance imaging. Think what that has done for the world of surgery that now surgeons can look into your body and find out what's going on before they ever have to cut you open. It, it just totally radically changed the field of medicine when they achieved that. But sometimes the most significant, the most influential, the most radical breakthroughs don't require incredible advances in science or even take years to appreciate. Equipping the trailer of a large truck with a large standardized removable box required nothing more than the stroke of imaginative genius. Yet today's global commerce, it's hard to imagine it without that. American entrepreneur Malcolm McLean invented the shipping container in 1956. And it took a decade for this really to catch on and for the, the significance, the possibilities of this to occur when it began to be applied by military use for shipping to the Vietnam War. Supplying that. Next slide, please. So we, we see that there's a lot that goes on that's radical, that has made great strides for the world. Now if we go back to that definition of a radical as a person who holds or follows strong convictions or extreme principles, then a gentleman by the name of Al Johnson would definitely qualify. Next slide. Not too many years ago, newspapers carried the story of Al Johnson, a Kansas man who repented, who came to faith in Christ. What made his story so remarkable was not his conversion, but the fact because of his newfound faith in Christ on a Sunday morning at the Seward Avenue Baptist Church in Hoyt, Kansas, this young man, Al Johnson, stepped to the pulpit and told the congregation how he, as a 19-year-old man with two others, had robbed a bank. Al Johnson shared with them that that had haunted him ever since. It's only been a few years, long enough, though, that the statute of limitations had run out. Couldn't be prosecuted, but he kept praying, God, what should I do, what should I do? And God told him, you need to confess this. So the day before, Al Johnson, not knowing about statute of limitations, had gone to the district attorney to turn himself in for the crime he committed years before. Al Johnson had also gone to the bank and taken out a loan to pay for his portion of what he had stolen from the bank. Now that's radical. That's radical. The other two guys, police thought, had been killed in a car wreck. They thought the guys that were killed in this wreck a few years back were the ones who'd robbed the bank. That wasn't the case. And Al Johnson helped the police find these other two men who actually were participants in this crime. Because his complete and total change of heart, he not only confessed the crime, 
but he made restitution on his part of what he had stolen. It certainly didn't require a picture from an MRI machine to see there had been significant heart change for Al Johnson. We know that the Bible is filled with people, very unique individuals, radical people. And this morning we're going to take some time and look at, at one of the, if you will, strangest in some ways, most unique, most radical of people in the New Testament, John the Baptist. So this morning, please turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 3. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 10. Matthew 3, verses 1 through 10. In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent, because the kingdom of heaven has come near. For he is the one spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, who said, A voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord. Make his path straight. John himself, had a camel hair garment with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then people from Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the vicinity of Jordan were flocking to him, and they were baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to the place of his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Therefore, produce fruit consistent with repentance. And don't presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father, for I tell you that God is able to raise up children for Abraham from these stones. Even now the axe is ready to strike the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that doesn't produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Lord, this morning as we come to the study, to hear your word, to have your Holy Spirit speak to our hearts, we pray that we are not like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, so caught up in ourself and our religion that we fail to understand the message of repentance that we are to embrace and, Father, that we are to live. We don't want to be recipients of the acts a tree that's just simply cut down and thrown into the fire because we failed to measure up to your expectations. So, Lord, bless us this morning as you just share your word with us. Lord, let me be minimized and you be maximized as we go through the morning. Father, how we love you. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. When we look at John the Baptist, he's really just such a, a, a unique character certainly had a, a tragic death but he, did, he served that death willingly because he was preaching truth and that's what got John the Baptist into trouble but when we look at John's ministry these ten verses give us three viewpoints three aspects of John's ministry first was a predicted ministry let's set the stage, stage for, for John and his radical ministry the Hebrew name for John is Jochanan which uh, signifies gracious or the grace of the Lord. And certainly John was a recipient of the grace that God had given. The first words that Matthew has in this chapter, in those days, is not speaking of the time when Jesus as a young boy came back from the land of Egypt with his parents. This is speaking of the time that he is living in Nazareth. At this time, the, uh, 25 to 30 years have passed. John the Baptist, six months older than Jesus, and both of them are probably approaching 30 years of age. So we begin to see they're both getting really into their ministry at this point in their lives. It's not probable that John had begun to preach or baptize very long before Jesus would begin his ministry because people would be looking then, who's this Messiah, where is he? You, you keep preaching about him, where is he now? We want to see him today. John was called to a different type of ministry than what we would think of for our typical church setting in today's world. The word preach that's used there is referenced more to something like a town crier that we would think of from maybe our 
uh, historic days and revolutionary war times. The town crier will go around sharing the news or if there's a warning or such as that that's going on. Well, that's what John the Baptist was doing. Maybe a street preacher would be something similar in today's world. But it wouldn't be a regular setting like this. John's workplace, certainly not a building. He was working along the Jordan River, the, between the Jordan River and the Dead Sea, east of Jerusalem. He's out in the wilderness. You can see th this is not a forested area, not heavily forested. Some villages, some towns there, but it's not a heavily populated area. But what's surprising is that even though he is out in this, this really rough terrain, the people still came to hear the message. They came from Jerusalem, they came from the towns, they came from the villages. They needed to hear this message because it's been a while since they've heard from God. This area, it's, it's rough, it's mountainous, very thinly settled. But still, people came. In verse 2, John is sharing a very simple message to them. Repent, because the kingdom of heaven has come near. Well, that's exciting for the people of Israel. It's been 400 years since they've heard from God, and now here's a new prophet. And he's saying the kingdom of heaven has come near. And they've got their own ideas about what that's going to mean for them and their lives. And you may wonder, say, well, now, why would people come and listen to this, this guy? He looks a little different. He's out there in, in the wilderness. Why would they come and listen? Well, both of his parents were descendants of Moses' brother Aaron. And his father, Zechariah, served as a priest. As a priest. So John himself, based upon his lineage and his father's uh, role, John himself also now would ca capture an audience. They would qualify him as saying, yes, this is one that we should and could listen to. So he's preaching, repent, the kingdom of heaven has come near. And they're anticipating that we're going to have a new political leader who's going to come in. We're going to have a military person who can come in and overthrow the Romans. We're going to have a king who's going to come in and take care of us from now on. This is the thing we've been waiting for for so long. And John's telling them to repent. To repent of their sins. And they're still thinking, Freedom, he's saying, repent of your sins. Even though the message is clear and it's simple, it's still not the message they were looking for or that they wanted to hear. John's saying repent because the kingdom of heaven has come near. Next Saturday, we're having time change. The clocks are going to move. John the Baptist didn't say, wait till next Saturday and repent. He didn't say, wait until this fall when we, we come back, when the clocks will fall back. Repent then. He said, no, repent now. The kingdom of heaven has come near. And people are responding to the message. Probably some of them didn't quite understand it fully. But it's been 400 years since we've heard from Malachi. And now here we've got another prophet. So he's saying, repent, be baptized. And they are. They were expecting a messianic forerunner. They knew that someone was going to come before this Messiah did. And here's the prophet John who's shown up. Deuteronomy 18.18 18 speaks of a prophet like Moses to whom all of Israel should listen. So they are based upon that as one verse of Old, Old Testament Scripture, verse 18.18. 18. As soon as I can locate it here, there we go. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. I will put my words in his mouth and he will tell them everything. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. So you add that to the forecast from Isaiah. A voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make his path straight. So there's been a forecast, a prediction that there's going to be this guy coming before the Messiah does. How cool would that be? Let's think about predictions. How many of you rely on weather predictions to plan your day or your schedule for the weekend? You rely on those. Because they are so accurate? <laughs> Is it that the, these forecasters don't know what they're doing, that other parts of the country, they are much more in tune and much more skilled at forecasting the weather accurately. So predicting the weather, that's tough. An astronomer, any astronomer, 
can predict with extreme accuracy where every star in the sky is going to be each night. But he doesn't have a whole lot of luck predicting where his teenage daughter is going to be at 1130 on Saturday night, does he? That's a little different situation. Predicting things can be tough. Back in 1967, experts predicted that by the turn of the century, we would have so much technology, so much equipment to do man's work, that Americans would only be working 22 hours a week. 22 hours a week. And only working 27 weeks a year. How cool is that prediction? And how close are they? Do we find that some people are working more than they were in 1967? 40 hour a week? No, no, they're working 50 or 60 or 70 hour weeks. And 27 weeks a year? Some people never take a vacation. Not because they don't want to, certainly not because they don't need it, but because the lifestyle, the demands say you got to work. Predicting things can be really tough. 1974, many of you will remember this, the first Arab oil embargo. Remember that? Gasoline went to 50 or 60 cents a gallon. We thought we would never survive that. And the, the experts are saying, we've really got to cut back on our fuel consumption because we're going through this fossil fuel and we're going to be running out in just a few years. We're about to expend all the fossil fuel supplies in the world. And how accurate has that prediction been? We're still discovering new supplies of fossil fuel and oil today. John's ministry had been predicted by Isaiah. Moses had spoken of this. And John, because this prediction's out there now, people are looking for a forerunner, for a prophet. So here he is. He's on the stage. And in many ways, he reminded them of Elijah. Had a message like Elijah. Clothing like Elijah. Living in an area like Elijah. So they're thinking, golly, this is cool. He is like Elijah. We need to hear the message. Everything was in John's favor. Predictions, family history, the situation all worked together with his predictive ministry to lead to a productive ministry. John embraced the role that God had given him. And we know sometimes that's tough. It's hard for us to, to move away from family or friends, move away from the comfort of a job we've known or a ministry that we've served in so long. It's tough to move away and do those kind of things that God calls us to do. But John fully embraced the role that God had given him from birth. That was to prepare the hearts of the Jewish people to receive the Messiah, the Son of God. And John had great success in this endeavor. Churches are like John. We all want to see results from our work. What is it that's required to have an effective ministry? To, to build a church, grow a church? A survey of 400 church dropouts. You're going to really like this. A survey of 400 church dropouts asked why they left their churches. Over 75% said, I didn't feel like anyone cared whether I was there or not. Remember what Chris Osborne said a few weeks ago when he was here? When he stepped up here, his first words were, this is a weird church. You guys are weird because it seems like you like each other. That's one thing that we can certainly claim truthfully, that we do like one another. And people do care. When you're not here, we care. When you're out sick, we care. You're on vacation. You're doing something else. We know you're okay, but still we care that you're not here. And for many people who have become a part of our membership, our regular fellowship, it's because they felt that sense of caring. <laughs> well, I just felt like Mexi New Mexico needed uh, a new ministry in place there. We were trying to plant a church there, Mary. And <laughs> So if 75% of these 400 that were surveyed said it didn't feel like anyone cared whether I was there or not, do you think that's true in other churches? Do you think the numbers go beyond just the 400 that were surveyed? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Often people don't know if you're in a church or not. When we were members of Two Rivers, we had some friends and Randy was one of the deacons. And Randy had been raised in a Methodist background and after a number of years being at Two Rivers, went back to the Methodist church. 
Been gone for about six months. And he gets a call one Sunday night. Randy, we're having deacon visitation next Sunday. Can you uh, go on visitation next Sunday? Six months. He's not had the first call from anyone. How are you? We've missed you. You've not been to deacon meetings. What, what's going on? Nothing for six months. And this is one of the deacons. How about you? you? You just come in, Mary, first time visitor, maybe attend a class a few times. Do you think that they would treat you better, look for you more carefully, be more diligent, and, and find out what's going on in your life? Should be. It should be. But do you think that that's how they treat a deacon, that they would do that with you as a new visitor? You see how we can easily lose people? But what's John saying? What's John doing that's getting their attention? Well, he's doing some things. He's saying, if you want to know God, then you need to repent of your sins. Let's contrast the churches where we say that 75% of the people say they drop out because no one seemed to care. What goes on when people go into a bar? Everybody knows your name. Everybody knows your name. And you go in and maybe because you, everyone knows your name, you talk to these people, you see them pretty regularly, and you tell one of them a secret. Do you think they're going to tell everybody else your secret? Probably not. One, they don't care. Two, the other people don't care. But three, they kind of feel like they're a friend, so they're going to keep your secret. Well, isn't it a shame that maybe in a bar there's a greater sense of companionship or fellowship than we would exhibit in churches across the world? So John is letting them know there's something you need to do. Did it work for him? It certainly did. In, in verse 5, we see how effective it was. Then people from Jer Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the vicinity of Jordan were flocking to him. And they were baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. They were flocking to John the Baptist. He's there, he looks weird, he eats weird food. He's telling them to repent of their sins and be baptized. And they're coming in droves for this. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? Some scholars argue that John's audience was in the 100,000 person range. Not just a couple of dozen, 100,000. That shows you how important the message was that people wanted to hear. They're coming from all over the area, from Jerusalem, Judea, all the area around there. Church growth is certainly predicated on many factors. Not always the same factors for all churches. Different areas, different things are important. President Teddy Roosevelt told of a situation, very interesting incident in his own words. On the beautiful little island of Isla Morda, he said there are several hundred homes that belong to people who come to stay for the summer. He said, I fell in love with that island and spent four summers up there. He said he heard about this person that they called a salty down easter. And... Now, everybody called this guy Uncle John. And President Roosevelt hadn't had the occasion to meet him. So he was such a quaint person, such a character, that he was a welcome guest in the home of all the prominent families who've got homes on this island. So Teddy's having dinner at one of these homes one night, and someone said, have you met John, Uncle John? And President Roosevelt said, no, I haven't, but I would love to. They said, well, he's here. He's in the kitchen. Come on. So they take him in, introduce him, and he and the president had just this great conversation. And as President Roosevelt gets ready to leave, he said, Uncle John, if you ever have anything going on, anything that you would like to ask me a favor for, please let me know. Would you do that? And Uncle John said, yes, sir, I will. In fact, I'm going to tell you one right now. <laughs> Probably wasn't the response that President Roosevelt was expecting. And Uncle John pointed and said, you see that little white church up there on the hill? You've been coming here for quite a while, and you've never come to that church. Now, Mr. President, I know that you're a Christian, and I know you'd like for people to go to church. You think people should go to church, don't you? <laughs> yes. Well, Mr. President, don't you think that if you came to that church that everybody else wouldn't want to come too? And Pro President Roosevelt said, I dropped my head in shame. He said, you're right. I'll be there this Sunday. Well, of course, the word's out, and it's standing room only. And every time President Roosevelt went back, 
he went to that church. You see, Uncle John, he could have been sort of awed by the president. Could have said, you know, well, I shouldn't say something like that to the president. You know, he wants to go to church, he'll come. He sees the church up there, he knows. But no, he was bold. John the Baptist was bold. Uncle John said, why don't you come to church? I bet other people will come too. John the Baptist is saying, why don't you repent of your sins and be baptized? And I bet maybe other people will come too. And it worked. People flocked to hear the message coming from all over the area. And they were baptized by him as they confessed their sins. This is a huge culture shift. Let's think about what the Israelites, what their history is, what their thinking is. Because for them, up to this point, baptism was something the Gentiles did. When you as a Gentile, when you say, I want to become a member of the Jewish faith, then you have to come and be baptized. Jews were not baptized. The Gentiles were. It's a four-part process that they're going to go through. They had to do sacrifice, circumcision, and memorization of parts of Moses' law. And baptism. But now John the Baptist is saying, you, you're a Jew. You're a lifelong Jew. You're born as a Jew. You need to repent of your sins and come and be baptized. It's very different. But they embraced the message. They got what he was saying. Because they knew that they were sinners. Now they're still probably thinking along the lines of the law. The 613 laws that they can't keep. There's no way they can maintain them all. So they're frequently doing sacrifices. They're trying to overcome this. But it, it's a never ending process for them. He's saying come. Repent. And be baptized. From John's perspective. From what he's doing here. This is a one time event. It's not the ritualistic consistent washing they're having to do. To cleanse themselves as they have in the past. A one time event. You're baptized. And that represents a transformed life. John's important role had been predicted. Certainly had a very productive ministry, but he also had to resort to a more pointed ministry. John was very strong toward those who needed it most. We see in verse 7, when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to the place of his baptism. Now, the NIV probably says this best when it says that they came to the baptism. Not to the place. They came to the baptism. They want to see what's going on. Because he's a threat. Jesus even isn't even on the scene yet from their perspective. But John the Baptist has already become a threat because he's talking about the coming Messiah. So they show up. Many of the Sadducees and Pharisees. Pharisees, very legalistic. They created all the laws. Sadducees, much more liberal. They only saw religion as being something that or their faith, their Jewish faith, as being part of religion. It's separate. They're thinking that should not, God shouldn't have any part in how we run the government. They really embrace more of a Greek model. So we've got two different perspectives there. But for both of them, it's hypocrites. So there's a number of hypocrites who are showing up there. They're insincere in why they are there. Other people come in because here's the guy who's preaching about the Messiah who's coming. But these showed up just simply because... We don't trust him. We want to know what's going on. If you were to describe a pastor, what do you think a pastor should be in terms of their demeanor? How they talk to people? How they interact? Probably many people would say that pastors should be soft-spoken. Quiet in nature. Certainly not confrontational. Easy to get along with. John the Baptist is anything but at this point. I mean, he is all over their case as soon as he sees them out there. What does he call them? A brood of vipers. Why would he call them a brood of vipers? I mean, if there's, let's say, 50,000, 100,000 people around, what's he saying to all these other people? Beware. Beware. There's a brood of vipers. There's snakes, poisonous snakes here. And we know how snakes are. It's not always up front. It's stealthy things that they're doing. But there is danger. Beware of these guys. Certainly, John the Baptist didn't win any friendship points with them when he called them that. But he was telling the truth. In 3, 8 through 10, he wasn't implying the hypocrites had come to baptism to show their own repentance. Anything but. He was confronting their consistent hypocrisy. They claimed to be repentant of their sins. But yet they went right back after their ceremonial washing or cleansing or sacrifice 
and repeated the same sins again and again and again. Sometimes we need to make a change. A few years ago, some friends of ours from Massachusetts came to visit. Got their two little kids with them. And the kids are out on the deck playing. We're inside, and all of a sudden you hear these, these wails, these cries. I mean, it's just hurting. Oh. And we go out to see what's going on. And Sarah, the little girl, probably three or four at the time. And Sarah had been running on our deck, and she got a splinter in her foot. It's a, it's a pretty good sized splinter and she is just boo-hooing and screaming. I mean it, it's horrible. You think that someone cut her leg off. Well they finally get her calmed down enough you know they can get the splinter out put some alcohol on it put a band-aid on it you know trying to console her and then Sarah <laughs> her chin's quit I'm, I'm never going to walk on wood again. You see, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the hypocrites, there was never this comment, I'll never do that again. They went right back to what they had done before. John wanted the Pharisees and Sadducees to see they'd picked up splinters like Sarah. But these religious elite, they're going to continue walking with those splinters. They assumed that they were holy simply because of their their family history you know we're children of Abraham that's all we need to know and John says no 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 that's not good enough because Abraham Abraham could raise children up from this stone right here he's saying it doesn't matter what family you've been born into God could take a stone and make his own children and they're going to be holier than you are ouch certainly John is all over their case he's being very pointed in his language with them John continued to use the language of the, the imminent judgment that's coming. In verse 3, 7, he talks about the coming wrath. In verse 3, 10, he says, Even now, the axe of judgment was ready to cut them off. Now, they're thinking, oh, we're holy. We're close to God. You're the one who's far away. But certainly, the Holy Spirit had to be pricking their heart. They had to be feeling a little concerned, a little worried, perhaps, about what is going on. John Use the imagery of fruit, telling them that they had been fruitless and they need to repent. He warned them that their fruitlessness was a warning of the impending judgment. A man was seated on a park bench. A little boy about five years old comes by and sits down beside him and starts whining what would you think would be his most prized possession, winding a watch. And the man looked at it and said, Well, son, that's a mighty pretty watch. Does it tell you the time? The little boy said, no, sir. you got to look at it. John bluntly, pointedly put the truth in front of the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees and said, you got to look at it. They didn't want to hear it, and they certainly didn't want to see the truth. John had a predicted ministry. It led to a very powerful and effective, productive ministry. But part of it was based upon the point of ministry where he was willing to get in people's face and say, you're hypocrites. You are nowhere close to God. You can repent and be baptized. And if there's anyone today in this room who has not done that, who's not accepted Jesus as Lord, not accepted God and said, I want you in control of my life, today's the day. Today's put away all the, all the distractions, all the things that we use as our excuses and say, I want to know the Christ. I want to know the God that you're talking about this morning. So come, give your life, repent of your sins.